Martin, if you want to get started, I think yeah, we're um, in good shape. Okay, so it's, um, you know, in, in, I, my name is Martin Hedders, and I'm um, in my function as um, one of the board members of the Center for American um, Architecture and Design. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to our um, Friday lunch forum um, today, where we will talk, and I think uh, the, the emphasis on talk, um, about um, questions of home, house, and housing. Um, we have well, with two guests, including me, where there's three of us um, who will sort of have a discussion. Um, there's um, Wilfried Wang, um, who is the O'Neill Ford um, professor here at UT and a founding partner of um, Hoi and Wang in Berlin. Jake Wegman, who is an associate professor um, here at UT in community and regional planning. Um, and then there's myself, Martin Hedersch, a lecturer here um, at UT also. Um, and I will not give lengthy introductions to what you do, but in fact, I will let you do that yourselves as you sort of like give your opening statements. Um, we have a format today that I'm just going to describe really quickly. Um, instead of having sort of three people show a series of slides, um, each of us will introduce ourselves quickly um, and sort of a position that we have with regards to what, in our opinion, the problems are and what some proposed solutions could be with regards to housing questions. Um, and then each of us will ask the other two one question and sort of moderate a really short 10 minute discussion in response to that question um, before we open it up to general questions from the audience. Um, so the hope is that, that it will be an interactive real forum rather than just showing images. Um, and that's really all I have um, to say for starters. So, so I would um, now ask maybe the other two um, participants to kind of introduce themselves quickly along with your opening statement. Um, Jake, do we, do we want to start? Sure, I'll start. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Jake Wegman. I'm on the CRP faculty. And the most relevant thing for today in my bio is that I wrote a commentary piece in Journal of the American Planning Association titled Death to Single Family Zoning. But I think as you're going to see, I think I'm going to actually end up being the conservative on this panel. But you know, we'll, we'll see how it plays out. So here's my basic claim. I'm going to claim to you there's nothing wrong with single family houses. There's something wrong with single family zoning, but not with single family houses. What's wrong is that in this country, we don't let single family houses change into something else after they've been built. We've spent the last hundred years making it harder and harder, almost everywhere, for anyone to do anything to a single family house except either expand it or tear it down and build a bigger one. Uh, now, I'm going to bring up a a photo because we get one photo in this little format we have here. Can everyone see it? This is from the late 19th century and it shows a mansion in the Capitol Hill neighborhood in Denver shortly after it was completed. This is the Molly Brown House Museum today for those of you who, who know the city. I used to live two blocks away. If Capitol Hill were being built today, I can imagine the critiques that people in planning or in other disciplines would have of it. It would be criticized for being an exclusionary suburban enclave for the wealthy, sort of the Westlake Hills of the 1890s. Um, you could see these giant brick and stone mansions as excessive, even garish. And my goodness, those trees, they look like popsicle sticks, so ecologically out of place on the semi arid high plains of Colorado. And yet, now I'm going to take this picture away and invite you to look at my backdrop. If you were to visit Capitol Hill today, you would find the most densely populated, walkable, and architecturally diverse neighborhood in all of Colorado, a veritable fantasia of what urban planning tries to achieve. So the problem, in my mind, it's not that Capitol Hill was allowed to be built in the first place. The problem is that new places like it can no longer evolve into something different. And I'll stop there. All right, thank you, Jake. Um, Wilfried, why, why don't you go next? Thank you. Thank you for um, asking me to join this discussion. And uh, it's something that um, it's been on my mind for many, many years. Uh, two years ago, I offered a studio on this topic uh, 
replacing suburbia, just simply, you know, doing away with it altogether. Well, actually, uh, the students that uh, took my studio came up with a complete range of solutions, and I think that was very fruitful, both uh, for me as a learning process, as well as I think for the students. But let me um, show the, the one image that I've been permitted to show. Um, and actually it's one text that summarizes my question and the one image that um, shows the problem in, at hand. Um, so the, my statement is suburbs and single family house are unsustainable. And if that is the case, if that thesis is correct, uh, in which direction should the American dream be redefined? If we look at uh, the growth of Phoenix, uh, the area that is red uh, is the original area around 1900. And the area that is yellow is uh, the growth in the decade of 2010, just the growth of 2010. Right, and now we're in 2020, and imagine there's another five, six, seven, eight percent of what is Phoenix. Uh, it has just grown sprawled. So I end that image here. Um, my point is that uh, the single family house as the key concept to the American dream is um, essentially leading to a kind of a geographic, topographic, um, ecological collapse uh, of um, uh, an unsustainable expansion. The infrastructure that is involved in that, uh, schools, health facilities, and all that, you know, water, big problem. All those kinds of issues are simply not going to be um, capable of dealing with this voracious uh, uh, expansion. And so, Rather than to have a single family house uh, typology with that kind of uniform density, um, countries around the world have to rethink this problem. It's not just the United States, it's everywhere. So density uh, is, a, is a key to the question of resolving this issue of how we uh, accommodate people and also mixed functions. So I, I agree with uh, Jake that we need to have much more flexible planning tools, but at the root of the problem is the single family house as a model that has been inculcated in people's minds for uh, millennia um, and also educated, uh, you know, generations of architects have been filled with images of Palladio and Le Corbusier and uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. And that is going to be very difficult to, to de decouple from people's minds. So there's, this, this topic is enormous. Uh, and uh, if we, you know, if we think about the issue of um, Black Lives Matter, you know, the, the need to redress uh, the, uh, the uh, ethnic relationships between um, populations, uh, we have to think about how to redress this issue of how we occupy the surface of this uh, globe. Okay, um, thank you, Wilfried. Um, so then I guess it's up to me last. Um, as I said, my name is Martin Hettish. I teach uh, studios, among other things, on housing. Um, and so I, I come from it with a distinct sort of perspective on kind of housing design. I'm going to share my screen really quickly. Um, and um, there is an image here. Um, let's see if everybody can see my screen. Um, that I think I think that there's two rows here in this image, the top row and the bottom row that I think stand for kind of some of the attitudes that I deem important with regards to sort of housing questions. The first row to me represents three conditions, and, and those are actually kind of like photos from three different continents um, that seem to be universally desirable with regards to um, how we live. The first one is the question of the, of the private entry door. So this idea of ownership of one's 
house or unit. The second one in the middle is that little plot of land, a private piece of land that is associated with that sort of sense of home. Um, and the third one is, for better or for worse, at the moment, the idea that a car needs to take to find its space somewhere in the proximity of the dwelling. I, I think those, two, those three principles at the moment are mostly found in the kind of um, single family house model. We tend to go towards extremes when we sort of um, rightly so, I think, insist on a certain necessity of density in cities for ecological reasons, for, for pure survival reasons, if you will. Um, but at the moment, we have the single family house that provides all of these amenities, and we have the apartment that provides mostly none of these amenities. So I'm interested in the range in between those, where we sort of find a compromise of sort of sustainable densities while maintaining some of the um, amenities that made people look for suburban houses in the first place. Um, that's the first aspect. The second aspect, so it, thus far, this is actually kind of an argument that's that's fairly close to what some may know as the missing middle debate currently. Um, I think a crucial difference for me comes in when it comes to solutions. And then that's where the bottom, bottom row, I think, represents some of my attitudes towards that. So we, we tend to kind of look, if we look at certain missing middle ideas, we tend to look at historic types that are being rediscovered um, and repurposed as kind of like past models that were better. I would actually argue that there is a sort of like different relationship between typology and innovation that I think we should fully engage in as designers. Um, and just exemplary, I'm just showing these four images that represent that development of one of those, you could argue, typologies that um, are in this medium density range which is the row house, from a sort of like industrial necessities to sort of like house people to a conceptualization in modernism. This is Ernst May in Frankfurt, um, to a sort of adjustment that starts to address the shortcomings, um, lack of privacy, privacy, uh, privacy in outdoor spaces, namely um, in the Siedlung Hallen, and then um, a projection that was a result from one of the studios on housing that I taught that really starts to merge kind of courtyard typologies with that idea of the row house. So that's my brief introduction here. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and now I think we should move to our questions. Leora, you labeled those questions. I think one was Wilfried's question, if I'm not mistaken. So let's start there and Wilfried can sort of ask your question to the both of us. Well, I think that, uh, I mean, Martin, you cheated uh, quite a bit because it was one image and you had a number. Uh, uh, so uh, but uh, as I say, uh, it's fine. Um, I don't think it's just a question of uh, typology. I think um, if you are looking at uh, the interrelation between mobility and uh, uh, the area, surface area covered, you will get a closer picture of the reality that the uh, impact of a single family house has. I have no problems with the research uh, in typologies, but I think that um, one of the issues that uh, you know greenwashing is uh, clearly leaving out is what are the other connections, right? And mobility is certainly one uh, big topic. And if you've got a big sprawl, uh, then you need to deal with that. And how do you address that issue, mobility and infrastructure? Is, is, was, was, so is that like, um, I would say like, let's move, is that a question, should we open that up as a general question? I think it's um, something, I, I think that, that all of us probably have something to say about. I mean, I think, I think that's, I think it's a crucial question in some ways. 
I mean, the, the question I could uh, pose to Jake is, you know, there's one thing about uh, the transformation of uh, an existing house, uh, adding uh, and increasing the height and all those kinds of things. Most houses aren't destined uh, or can't cope with that because uh, uh, the construction system uh, doesn't um, take more weight. Uh, it's not easily uh, transformable. You know, the balloon frame is not particularly uh, um, malleable, I would say that, you know, you start cutting out whole uh, sides, uh, etc. Um, so the, the issue is uh, not so much that we are, uh, we are, as, as a civilization have, uh, or the civilization has made certain wrong turns. And the question is, are we capable of adapting our way into a sustainable future. And um, I don't think the simple, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think you can just reform uh, suburbia. I, I don't think that that's the path. Should I go? Yes, sure. Okay. I think I guess where we disagree, Wilfred, is I think there is a path forward where suburbia that is primarily based on single family houses could be made to be sustainable. Um, I, I certainly agree that we should not be building new neighborhoods where you will never be able to do anything other than by getting in a car. And unfortunately that's true for a lot of new suburban subdivisions that are being built. But I don't think that has to be true. And I don't think you have to do away with single family houses as an aspirational housing form that let's face it, resonates with the vast majority of people in the United States. And I know it's a different conversation in, in the rest of the world, but here in the United States, there's just, there is just no possibility of flipping a switch and getting Americans to desire the um, individualism and the privacy that comes with the single family house. Um, I'm thinking of the research, I'm gonna get his name wrong, uh, the Dutch social psychologist. Oh, I had his name written down. Um, Geert Hofstede, apologies for butchering his name, but he, spent decades studying the, if you will, the, the, the national culture personality traits of dozens of countries around the world through extensive survey work. And the United, the, he, he boiled it down to six dimensions in the United States on the individualism dimension was absolutely the number one country. It wasn't like the 15th country, it was the first country. And I just, I don't think you can wish that away. Um, but luckily, I don't think you have to. I think with um, the MacArthur genius uh, fellow, Saul Griffith, an Australian genius, he has come up with a way where the US economy could become carbon net, uh, net zero by 2050. We could basically keep our lifestyle. We just, we have to electrify everything. We have to electrify transportation. We have to make power in green ways. We have to get rid of gas, water, uh, heaters, and, and furnaces, and run them on, on carbon, uh, zero carbon electricity and so forth. So I completely agree that we should have more walkability, we should have more transit, we should densify certain places, but I don't think that that's the whole ball game, because if it is, I, I don't think we're gonna, we're gonna be able to do it, but luckily I don't think we have to. You know, I think, Wilfred brought up the, the question of mobility, transportation. I think I think that's a an interesting um, starting point because obviously part of the whole inefficiency of what we know as suburbia is, is based on the, the need for transportation. And and I think there used to be a very simple equation, like in, in some ways, the more suburban, the further away from the center um, things were. And I don't I'm not sure that this model still holds up today everywhere. I, I think we find, ironically, we actually find construction of new housing, that, that is single family sub, suburban typology housing, but we also find construction of um, new, let's say tech um, 
industry or or other um, kind of non housing potentially kind of like workplaces or um, in, in the same kind of um, range of um, the, the sort of like beyond the traditional center. So I think in some ways maybe the the question of suburbia versus center is, is sort of like a false dichotomy these days. And and if we think about this as a sort of like slightly changing pattern of urbanization, one of the one of the productive questions would be how how can we actually kind of integrate those two things that are both being built beyond the traditional city? And how can we actually kind of create these you know, if you will, sub centers or like I don't know what what you want to call them, um, that in their own right would actually make it unnecessary to to drive to what's traditional the city center. But I think you're just you're just postponing the moment of truth, both of you. I mean, it's fine saying you know these are popular types. Uh, the single family house is a popular type, no question. In Germany, just for your statistical, you know. Uh, pleasure. There are 19 million residential buildings. Yeah? 19 million. That includes apartment buildings, uh, duplexes, you know, uh, and single family houses. Of the 19 million, 16 million are single family houses. 83% of the residential stock is single family houses. And they have been built over the last 60 years, mostly. Right? That, I think, is an absolutely telling figure. Now, to you, uh, Martin, um, if you think that uh, decentralized uh, uh, hubs can solve the problem of traffic, fine. I think you can dream on, because the fact is that uh, you know, the duration time taking um, people taking, uh, you know, the, the, taking into account the distances people travel and uh, the time it takes, they just become longer and longer. And Austin is a prime example of things getting worse and worse. So to believe that you can, you know, uh, achieve a kind of a, a more happy distribution of um, places of work and residences is like, you know, uh, hoping for kind of a um, the lottery win uh, over and over again. It's it's just not going to happen. So um, the the other problem is, you know, we're consuming more and more. We're sealing more surface area uh, with streets, with uh, buildings, and that is not sustainable. So. Let's let's just get real. Uh, we are uh, we are. This, sorry, sorry, the single family house is the end of the line of a linear process of lifestyle where we excavate out of um, uh, some, you know, material uh, resource place and we dump things into a landfill at the end. That is, and the single family house is one of the most unproductive ways of dealing with lifestyles. Unless we create a productive single family house, we are not going to uh, save suburbia. And I think that there's a way of uh, uh, trying to make a single family house more productive by, for example, growing food, um, harvesting energy and uh, water, right? But that's a kind of a minor start. It's not going to save the single family house as a typology. You want to go ahead, Martin? Um, yeah, I'm. I'm wondering. You know, we we all had sort of like these questions that we had that we're sort of like already kind of deviating from in some ways. Um, so I'm I'm just curious whether whether we should sort of like um go back to those um questions yeah, in, in some ways. Question. Um, let's go to the next question. Because I, I think in in some ways, you know, I, I see Wilfried's question. Um. Or, or sort of what we're talking about may actually tie into your question, Wilfried, that, that you had up in, in the beginning, right? Like the to to what where would the American what, what you call the American dream, um, where would that have to go? In what direction would that have to be modified? So so I think that's maybe sort of a question that in some cases dovetails with what we're 
talking about when, when you talk about like you know okay more productive single family houses i understand that that give back to to the environment i guess to the, the community to the environment to to sustainable um things i think as one possibility so you know i, I feel like let's sort of take that on as a question because i i do think that the american dream and, and I, I stumbled across that in your question you know, it's 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 a bit problematic because the american dream is so tied into um well first of all i would question whether that still exists as a unified ideal second i would say historically it's it's very much tied to the land grab of staking your claim in a what used to be a communal territory so you can say that that's flawed from the beginning um but on the other hand i would agree with jake in that like ultimately however flawed it is it seems to be one of the major um identification um functions with with the dwelling right like that what i said like your private door your, your private patio your private like ideally i want to be able to walk around my house as far as possible so i mean i live in an apartment all right i have my private door uh, i have a private uh, loggia balcony uh, and for me that's enough uh, i uh, there are families living in this house there are 44 apartments in this building and there are families with kids living in this, you know, uh, all throughout Berlin, there are families living inside these apartments. I think I need to ask my question because I think this directly relates. If you, if you both don't mind, how about I ask my question, then you respond directly. Does that sound good? Okay, my question is, is it possible to convince Americans that raising children in an apartment is an aspirational lifestyle anywhere other than New York City, the great exception, Honolulu and maybe a few other tiny pockets in the United States. And if so, if you do think it's possible, how do you convince people that it should be aspirational? Well, but I'm, I'm going to let that pass, question pass right to to Wilfried. I think. I think uh, you know you're you're raising a very good question. And if you look at the housing typology in Austin, there are a lot of apartment blocks where families are just doing that. Right, these cruciform apartment blocks with throughways, uh, with surrounded by uh, parking areas, they are apartment buildings where families are raising their children. Oh, so there's, uh, there's uh, hardly uh, any. But I'm uh, not aspirational, though. Asp as an no, aspiration. I'm not saying. You know, I'm not saying. Uh, I'm not. I'm not denying the fact that there's an aspiration, mm -hmm. and of course, you know the aspiration is cultivated by a huge industry, a cultural industry on the one hand and the building industry and a finance industry and on the other hand, and a car industry, right? So let's not ignore those kinds of interests that are at play. And uh, anybody like, like me who goes out in, in, in public and says single family houses should no longer be permitted, they're just going to get shot in, in places like Texas, right? So. And that's Honestly, anywhere in the United States, it's not just anywhere anything. in the United States, probably even in Germany. Uh, and and the, the question is, uh, if you if you just continue both Martin and and Jake, if you just continue to say, oh, well, it is a popular thing. Yeah. And people like it and people aspire to it. And therefore, it's OK. No, it's not OK. And so the question is, do we have the capacity to re-educate people? I use that word. I know it's uh, very uh, laden, but I'm afraid there's, there's no alternative, right? Because unless we uh, improve the capacity of the single family house to contribute not just to the community and the environment, but to the users themselves, we're not going to get out of this problem of uh, an unsustainable um, uh, lifestyle. And can you yeah, talk a little bit more about how exactly it's unsustainable? Well, I mean, we know that, uh, uh, you know, the so-called nuclear family was four people uh, living in an apartment, uh, the same area uh, as the house uh, equivalent. Um, the, the family living in the house has 50% um, more energy requirements and, and puts out more CO2 emissions. So, I mean, what, what do you say to that? It's, that? That's just simple math. You can say, yeah. If they started harvesting their own energy, 
they would at least cover uh, a, a lot of their demand that way. But they don't at the moment. And they could, they could. You know, they could literally they could. harvest their own food uh, if they planted things. But that means time that means productive. And that is another kind of a, a change in model because, anyway, um, so, so well, we need a shift. I, I would, Wilfred, I would, um, you know, in some ways, I, I, I'm going to play this sort of like card of the moderate here, knowing full well that moderates are the first ones to get shot in a civil war. Um, but I would argue that you are in some ways um, falling into that trap of the dichotomy between there's the apartment on the one side and there's the single family house on the other side and there's nothing in between. No, it's not true. I'd say um, you know, the single family house can become more productive, but it has but, to be, it has to do that. I think I think the argument though would be that there is something in between. At least my argument would be that there's something in between the apartment and the single family house that is neither. That is that is neither a single family house on a lot, but it's a combination of units that maintain some of the qualities, but also provide some of the density and the um, sustainability benefits that arguably we need. I mean, there, there's a it's a question of survival, as, as I think you, you rightly say. No, no um, so, question about that, Martin. You know, and, and West Campus Austin is a prime example of how you can transform an area in a radical way. I don't think it's urbanistically uh, anywhere where it should be, but where it really uh, shows how you can transform a suburban uh, typology is that you can, you know, involve people. Uh, and owners uh, to say, well, you can increase the density and there, you know, you make a million bucks uh, out of your lot. The point is, there are tools that en enable suburbia to be developed in, in a kind of maybe too radical way in West Campus, um, but it's a kind of a transformation that Jake is in, in principle uh, arguing for, right? And he, he pointed to the image in his background in, in the first few minutes of how a neighborhood has transformed from the single family house to, you know, a, a, row, a, a row house typology. Uh, so all these things can happen. The point is that the embedded energy in construction is already uh, a an issue, right? And if we just tear things down, uh, it's not going to really improve the situation drastically unless we go in the direction of West Campus. And, and that, you know, is not necessarily a, a solution for all of uh, suburbia, right? So what I'm, what I'm saying is, Martin, you, you know, you're talking about, your conception is new build. My argument is that we have to stop building single family houses we have to densify existing fabric as far as we can, and we have to develop, uh, you know, solutions for um, for the kinds of typologies that you've been speaking about at the beginning of your presentation. I, I think so. Um, you know, Jake, I wanted to go back to like I think I think the, the sort of question like how how do we actually how would we convince people <laughs> to kind of live in dense like whatever dense um, to want to, right? Because plenty of people do already in the US. We should, and and those and point. those people, I think, I think I know, you know, I know people who are moving from single family houses to kind of often smaller, denser types of housing, and they're very happy to do that. Um, I, I think those are not our target group in some ways. Um, but you know, I think one of the one of the questions for me would would then maybe that that this would lead to in, in what way does the apartment need to change right in, in what way because in at the moment i think many people see apartments well first of all apartments tend to be smaller like so so that's i think one thing where at least if we look to austin right like what's being built um in the kind of new apartment blocks is usually in terms of square footage much smaller therefore much harder to make work if you are some type of like either family or other kind of intentional community um, that involves more than two people. Um, I think the second question is that I think a lot of people look at apartments as sort of essentially the same as or wanting the same as a house, but less. It, it's, you know, I, I have 
it's essentially an individualistic idea of owning or renting a piece of land that just happens not to be a piece of land, but it's up on the third floor, fifth floor. And so I think um, one thing I find interesting and promising are, are these, um, are thinking, rethinking apartments as something that where the proximity to a sort of ideally a collective of people can actually kind of like provide amenities that the single family house does not provide, right? Like, so, so the idea that right now, most apartment complexes, the best thing that they come up with is a shared pool. Is that really the best we can do? Is, is you know, I think, I think there are models um, that experiment with, with um, much more interesting, let's say sort of like amenities, um, and I think I don't like the term amenities, maybe sort of like um, shared collective functions. Like we, if we think of live work or if we think of what um, children would need in terms of a space if they were to grow up in apartment. So, so I think that to me would be a potentially productive question, um, you know, thinking of future design studios here for myself, but but in, in some ways, like, well, how, how do we reinvent that type of the apartment in order to um, focus on, on what the what its potential strengths are, rather than to see it as kind of the lesser solution for housing, but but actually pitch it as as something completely different? But how do you get someone to build it, Martin? I don't know. That, that I, I would ask. I would ask you that. I, I don't. You know, I don't know. From being built right now. Like, um, you know, I, I, I hate. You know, yeah. lots of things about zoning, but actually, I can't blame that one on zoning. So, so one. I mean, one thing I know. I know that there are um, co-op models that I think in Berlin actually sort of there are some of these that exist. So I, I don't know that much. I, I think it would be interesting to hear more about that because I think that co-op yeah. model. Um, yeah. There are very successful co-op models where mm -hmm. you have exactly what you say, right? And they there are they have shared facilities where there are spaces for um, daycare nurses uh, to look, you know, to to stay uh, overnight if they need to look after uh, two or three people in this apartment building. But let me just repeat, you know, if we think that one and a half degrees Celsius is the limit that we should not exceed in uh, climate change. We are, we are already close to it, right? Then, then if, we, if two degrees is the next limit, we, we should not exceed. And if we think that we have 10 years, we don't have 10 years to mess around, not answering the question that is, we cannot expand in the same way as we are now uh, at this rate, internationally. So everybody does their homework and says, what are the consequences in these different sectors, right? In the primary in energy production, in the building industry, in the question of mobility, uh, in food, and all these kinds of things. If we say, what are the drastic solutions in all these different sectors, we come up uh, with solutions in our sector of the building industry, and we would have to admit that we cannot continue in the same way as we are now. Okay, now so that's where, that's where I disagree. Let's, I, so, yeah, and, and if, that is the, if that is the honest answer, where do we start pairing our ideas, our dreams, our ideals, our, you know, popular types? I think and we might be disagreeing about uh, time scales because I think if, if, keeping, if keeping it below two degrees Celsius depends on convincing Americans and people in other countries that all new single family house construction must be halted within by 2031, then, then I think we might as well just pack up our tent and go home. That, that's not, okay. I don't think that, but luckily in my opinion, that doesn't, <laughs> uh, our survival, I don't think depends on that. I think there are so many other things that we can do that are gonna help so much well, air capture and electric to find Fine. vehicles. And, and, and I think we have to work on promoting urbanism and, you know, maybe family living in apartments, but I think that's a 30 to 50 year project. I don't think yeah. it's a 10 year project. Jake, I, I don't, don't want to- it's politically possible. Uh, Jake, I don't want to preclude uh, the possibility of innovation, right? And for sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere and all those kinds of things. Uh, I just don't think that at the rate at which we're going, that we are, uh, we're still in the, 
process of self-deception, you know, I mean, we are, we're deceiving, majority of people are deceiving themselves because they believe that there are, you know, there's some kind of solution around the corner. You know, people, people aren't <laughs> changing their lifestyles because they're saying, oh, look, the Chinese are much, you know, they're putting out many more CO2 tons uh, a year oh, than we yeah, but, but are. So but we, we the, have made some progress, though. That's the thing. We've, you know, per capita emissions in the U.S. are are okay. Are, are, to, are yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know, you are still uh, right at the top of the scale uh, compared to compared to per capita it's, in China. It's moving in the right compared. direction. Yeah, um, maybe maybe no. because I'm, I'm just looking at at the time here. I guess. Um, I, I wanted to just one quick follow up question. I think that we have been straddling like with with what's been sort of coming up, and, and that was actually kind of the question that I had in, in my back pocket, um, or half the question. Who like if we sort of like say like there are certain people that in order to kind of achieve those sustainability goals, because I, I think climate change is really sort of like the big pressure on on us. Um, who would have to be involved in the conversation today in order to get any chance? Like, what, what are the sort of roles? Because I, I think that's, to me, that's a big, big question mark. I, I feel we look at, you know, architects do their thing, um, like planners do their thing, um, and kind of zoning is, is a, another thing. So I, I think in, in some ways, like, I'm just curious on your opinions of how or who would have to be involved in that conversation, let's say. I mean, the academia has to be involved. If we if we look at ourselves and if you look at this discussion, right, uh, we are not really moving the the dial in any direction at the stage, right? Because you know, I, I would presume that the majority of people listening to this uh, discussion uh, share your points of view, uh, Jake and Martin, right? And they do not share my point of view, or maybe there are one or two, but uh, I would say, and, and it's no different in the general population. So my sense of uh, being able to convince people is no, zero chance, absolutely not. And so, you know, fly around the globe, drive, uh, you know, the, the next SUV, uh, buy another one, you know, complete your fleet so that you have your typical three per family. It's not going to happen. So if it's not going to happen, then what do we do? We do what happens in uh, New Orleans. We build higher dams, right? I mean, it, it's, you know, it's it, it just, the, the, the ridiculousness is just, uh, just outrageous. And uh, 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 my sense is um, we just have to accept that uh, climate is changing and that it's going to get hotter. And those people who have the money will build more, you know, AC units. Uh, how, about I give a, how about I give a quick response and then can I suggest that maybe we move on to uh, Q&A and in, in general yes. discussion pretty yeah. soon? Okay, um, I divide the problem into two. So like the first bucket is convincing people in existing single family neighborhoods that they should allow them to change somewhat. And I think our professions actually have relatively a small role in that because it's just a political fight. No one wants their neighborhood to change. And it's not only rich white people who don't want their neighborhoods to change, no one wants their neighborhood to change. So I think that's just, that's a, that's a, a tough political conversation. It is, there is starting to be some headway in some places. You know, Minneapolis ended single family zoning, for example. On the, uh, the other part of it to me is building new, you know, large scale communities. And that's where I think architects and planners have an enormous role to play because they've got to come up with something that's so awesome and so new and different that people love that it'll entice them to choose that instead of the American dream as it's been packaged. And I think there's all kinds of ways to do that. There's this hunger for a life that's more green, that's not so based on a car, that is walkable, that is communal, that, that is, you know, you run into diverse people and all those sorts of things. So I, I think that I think there's a big role there. Okay, I, I would suggest like we, we move on to opening it up to to some participants question. You know, I, I 
just saw Alex um, raise her hand um, so to get at least a couple of, of questions in here. Sorry. Can I go ahead? Yes? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, you can hear me. Um, sorry, I'm on my phone because my internet doesn't work here. But uh, thanks for your conversation. I did miss a little bit of, at the beginning because of the studio. But so maybe you talked about it. But I was wondering when uh, when Jake was talking about his second question about the new developments. Um, somehow, one figure that to me is missing in this conversation is the the figure of the investor, um, of not the person who is actually looking at how to best satisfy even the needs or desires of the uh, people who are gonna be living in these places, but the person who is thinking about how to best speculate on that project, right? And um, I, I wonder whether this is not really a very important you know, area to look into because from my experience, very often when I witness these conversations of people who are potentially interested in investing in housing. And it's of course an incredibly important, you know, uh, way to speculate, unfortunately. Um, the conversations I hear is like, well, I can only afford to build a single family home. So there's an incredible push from this fragmented market to actually uh, maintain that status quo because it's so easy to invest. Uh, into a single family home. Like many of people can do that by getting a small loan and, and invest in that and build that, right? It's much harder to have enough uh, financial uh, capacity to build a uh, mixed um, project or, or, or multifamily apartments. I don't know if this is something that you've talked about before, maybe uh, Jake can shed some light on that if you if you don't think that that's an important part of the conversation. Well, I, I think what you're saying is very important, Alex. Um, I would bring it back to the rules that we have. So, you know, right now mm -hmm. the rules in Austin say that if you want to tear down a single family house and replace it with a mansion, nothing is going to stop you. You will automatically get approved. You don't have to go through any kind of process at all. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you want to build a large apartment building, you're going to have to go through a lot more intensive process. And the only kind of entity that could ever get through that is going to be a large institutional yeah. real estate investor who's going to be able to kind of wait out that long process. So I think if we change the rules so that it didn't work that way, I think we might get some new possibilities. That we what, what seems ironic to me, kind of looking at this with, with not half the knowledge that Dig has um, on, on kind of the, the inner workings, is that we find new land being developed by the square mile. If you go to the eastern like edge of Austin, between Austin and Maynard, um, and yet what is being developed is something that looks essentially like a lot of single family houses that all look the same by the same developer. And, and so to me, as, as maybe a naive architect um, who doesn't really know that much about how these things come to be, there's a tremendous chance of actually um, doing things better because there is a huge volume that's being built there, right? So, so I, think, I think that to me would be a question, like how, how do we get somebody how, how, how could that make economic sense for somebody who invests in that pile of land development at the same time? Can I suggest that uh, people ask very short questions and that we try to answer them uh, in very short ways? I, I think then that's, we've got yes. Five people, we've got five people who want to, and we have 10 minutes left. Let's have just one person respond to each question. How about that? F Fernando, I think you are next on... I'm sort of trying to keep track here, <laughs> so. Thank you, Martin. I'll be very quick uh, and bold. Uh, this country was founded on settler colonialism and ownership of land is a crucial tenet of our entire society. There is no way to deal with this issue without addressing that. There's a system that subsidizes land ownership for one group of people and that creates barriers and hurdles for land ownership for another group of people. And I, I really don't think we can uh, address those issues without addressing those fundamentals of this society. That's it. Should we get another comment or question? Yes, I mean, I, I think, Fernando, I, I, yeah, just briefly, I, I think I agree. I don't know 
if there is an answer to that question immediately, well, right? I mean, like, I, I, so, but it's been uh, it's been uh, documented that certain ethnic uh, groups uh, do not benefit from the same credit uh, and you know financing opportunities than than others in the United States and other countries. So it's a clear uh, system of segregation. Michael, I have you next up. Yeah, I, I, just to respond to Alex, I think that the finance, financial structures are very, very determinative. And I agree with Jake that so is the law. Um, I mean, it's probably true that um, you can build apartments cheaper per square foot than you can build houses. But Martin, to address you, you know, the designs that you're beautiful designs, let me just say that right away, that you and your students are doing have huge inefficiencies of square feet to surface area. They're extremely crenellated. There's a huge amount of outdoor walling, right? The compactness of apartments is basically where their economy comes from. And the, even though you might make a compact housing, uh, the complexity of it is such that I, I wonder whether you could produce those at even less per square foot than individual houses. And I think that's the dominant factor. I think if we could make your kind of houses cheaper than individual houses, um, this would be a this would be a, a, a self fulfilling thing. Okay, we have um, un unless somebody has as um, comments to answer, like I, I would go um, Abia, if you're next on the list. Um just wanted to, first of all, apologize, Dr. Wegman, that despite being your advisee, I sort of agree with Dr. Wang's um, <laughs> <laughs> approach. That's it, um, Abia. It's all over. <laughs> uh, my question is actually for you, Dr. Wegman. Um, it seemed like you were saying that, of course, changing the culture is a political question, but do you think that zoning can actually play that role where you do allow for that transformation to happen? But do you think that incrementally that might that might allow for that NIMBYism to go away? I think NIMBYism is going to gradually fade with a generational turnover, because I think the things that people and Americans of all backgrounds in their 20s and 30s want is so radically different than what Americans in their 40s, 50s, and 60s and upward want. Well, so I, I think it's going to start fading away. But I, it, it is. I think it is going to have to be incremental. It, it, that's the only thing that can happen in a democracy. Nim NIMBYism uh, was bought out in West Campus, basically, right? They, from the uh, point four um, FAR was, you know, upgraded to twelve. <laughs> And anybody who owned anything there just said, "Great, let's let's you know let's um, make sure that we sell these things and uh, we make a pile." And so they did. Uh, but it's not urban design uh, that we should really be calling you know ideal. Um, however, it is possible, and in the United States, this is one way of doing it. I, I had. Quick, very quick follow up just on, on sort of some of the finance questions, because like it's a sort of question of efficiency comes up. And, you know, I think that that's certainly one concern. Um, I, I I think in some ways the determining factor is land cost in most cases, I would say, probably more than construction. I mean, at the moment that's, that's changing again. Um, but but I would sort of like think that 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 would be something we would have to sort of like talk about as as well um, with with that sort of like question of what is worth worthwhile um, at least if if we're sort of like if we're talking about sort of like um, densifying kind of um, areas that are fairly sort of pro in proximity to kind of centers that's just another thought that that I'm just going to throw in there as as a follow up. Martin, land cost is a, is a uh, result of uh, FAR. I'm, I'm not. I'm not saying it. It isn't, but I think it is a factor that we haven't talked. You know that that we haven't sort of really considered. I think that's especially when when it comes to the questions of affordability, which, which I think is. Um, anyway, Juan, I think you were you had your or, or Miriam. Did I forget you, Miriam? You had your hand up, and I don't see it anymore. 
Yeah, sorry, I'm having device issues. Um, and so I haven't um, heard the last five minutes or so, but I switched to my phone. So I'm just going to ask it without turning my camera on. My question um, has to do with um, local social movements, particularly those centered on um, racial and social justice. And while in the United States, when it comes to scale, these movements have been small, we do have some that have tried to advance um, alternative economic models that focus on local governance, community ownership, economic relocalization. Um, the community land trust model, for example, emerged or gained momentum through the civil through civil rights activism in the 1960s to promote black asset ownership. And so I'm wondering um, if the um, three of you have any reflections on the intersection of those movements um, with this particular conversation. I mean, I think it's uh, globally speaking, the cooperative system uh, does work. Uh, and in, in cities like Berlin, uh, these have been, uh, you know, they've been quite successful, but they, uh, they will only provide a fraction of the required demand, you know, the demanded uh, units. And so unless there is a strong political support uh, that will pave the way for, um, you know, finance that is, uh, that is easier to get hold of than the normal channels, uh, you're not going to get a, a real push in that direction. And, and then, you know, the next question is land. Yeah, my, my off the cuff uh, take on that is I'm all for it. Let a th let a thousand flowers bloom, um, but I also think that the hunger in the United States for the front door <laughs> that Martin was talking about, and with free and clear ownership and total control over a piece of land, I think is very strong. And I think that's going to be. I I don't see that changing as as the aspiration among almost all social, racial, ethnic, and other groups in the United States. That, that's, that's my flippant, re flippant response. Okay, um, Juan, I think you're next and then... Um... Okay, well, thank you. And just like Alex, I, I had studio and by the time I was able to join, I joined a little late, but I caught, uh, I think Wilfred was the one speaking when I, when I joined it. And I know that this is, so I'm sorry, I missed the first part, but uh, I, I, I got the, 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 the heart of the discussion and, and I, I just wanted to make a couple of uh, comments. I mean, I agree with Jake that sometimes uh, in architecture school, we think that, and I think it's good for us to have these aspirational goals about how our profession can really change uh, uh, society in ways that to me, sometimes it feels a little almost uh, naive in the sense that uh, I think that the a lot of the issues that we're dealing with are so complex and so large that it's not an, a design issue. I mean, I think that there, I mean, I think Jake's mentioned it at some point, is very political, is very, you know, a lot of the things that we think that we will solve, like if the cities were denser, everything would be better. I think it's, 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 it's not, it's not a, something that I uh, buy easily into because I know that sometimes people think that cities will be less racist if they're this way or that way, when in reality, racist, racism is uh, people's uh, will, not the, they can find ways to be racist in very dense cities, in very low density cities. They can, you can have crime in low density cities and high density cities. You can have poverty in high density cities and low density cities. So sometimes we make this in, in fair, this kind of automatic sense of what will give us. And, and many times the results are not there. Uh, in terms of the, the cities that have embraced some of those approaches. So as, as, as many of you know, I come from, I was born in Barcelona, I grew up in Madrid. So I, I come from a world that is very different than Austin in the sense that I didn't own a car or lived in a house until I moved to Austin. But when I went, moved to Austin, I had to do that because that's the way the city is. So I think that that's another aspect that I want to emphasize that when Wilfred talks about this general statement, I think it's very hard to it's very easy to forget the incredibly culturally different places that we're talking about when we're talking about places. And it's very, very important that we take them into consideration because it's not the same. I don't pretend Austin to be like Madrid and I don't Madrid pretend Madrid be like Austin. I enjoy them for what they are. I know they're different. I join them, enjoy them the same way and I live very differently in one place than another. 
but I'm very aware that they're very different. And therefore, I cannot assume that I can extrapolate what I think is from one place into the other automatically without all the realities. Most people in Spain have grown up in apartments. Their grandparents, my grandparents grew up in a, all in apartments. My parents grew up in apartments. I grew up in an apartment. Most Americans didn't grow up in, an, in apartments. They grew up in single family houses. Their, their kids grew up in single family houses. Their kids, the kids of their kids is very, uh, it's almost scary to think that we can all of a sudden come and pretend that we're going to impose this view that is coming from a very learned academic world that is telling people what they should do. And I think that especially Wilfred, and I'm going to be very direct about the fact that you have been community commuting to Texas for 20 something years. You probably have the highest polluting carbon footprint in the entire world in terms of what you have been doing for 20. I mean, I, I would remind that if 1% of the people in the world had done what you had done in the last 20 years, the levels of greenhouse emissions will be like off the charts. So I think that's a reality that is important to acknowledge that you cannot just put all the pressure in one thing and not think about transportation, food production, and who is delivering the message? It's very hard not to think about that reality, Wilfred, when you think about you telling people what to do when you have done and continue to do one of the things that is probably the most unsustainable of all the things, all the infrastructure that gets you from Berlin, from your apartment in Berlin to your apartment in Austin, it's almost, it doesn't count because you come and you tell people what to do here and you go back to your apartment in Berlin. It's not easy to accept that these grand announcements that tell people what to do come from very contradictory, not only from the European world in general that have caused most of the problems and now are leading the solutions because they have more wealth to address the, the challenges and tell other countries in the world what they should not do after they have done it and accumulated a lot of wealth that allows them now to have more advanced solutions to the problems is very, very problematic for me to, to, to face that without basically acknowledging all these other contradictions that come from who is delivering the message and this kind of almost authoritarian way of seeing how we're going to impose a view that is very, very scary for a lot of people for good reasons. Because they, I mean, imagine like a family in, in the US that has kids go to school in bicycles, they live there, they have a house, they, they maybe go to a national park, maybe never go, maybe to go to Europe once, they take in a plane. Why would you tell them they, they cannot live that way? If they have solar panels, they can collect their, you know, there are other solutions. They can be electric cars. They can, you're saying people don't do electric panels. You know, in my house here, I collect 70, 65% of my electrical electricity. I collect my water. I, you know, it can, people can work from home. There, there are many ways to think about how people have enjoyed the ability to be in nature and live differently. Do we need to all live like Hong Kong? Once you make it taller, why don't we make all the buildings a hundred story tall? What, what do you end the reality of how dense should be? Is it all based on your instinct or based on what, what is the criteria? Should we all live like all those crowded cities in China or in, I, I don't understand how we can make an argument that is very so grand in, in, in it's an ambition without thinking that the specifics of each place and the gradual improvement is the only way that you can find a solution rather than this very grand imposition. So that's, that, those are my comments. Well, we're past hey. time and we certainly Oops. want to recognize that. Past you know, time. So yeah, I'm, I'm happy to stay on with whoever is interested to, to continuing this conversation. Um, Leora, if, if that's a possibility, I don't know. Um, but but also like um, you know sort of officially so thank thank you for everybody for participating before everybody like trickles out um, and I, I think it's a it's a really interesting conversation for which I think an hour is <laughs> vastly inadequate time frame. Um, well, I, if I may just say something in general, I think um, it's interesting that. Um, uh, cultural differences are being invoked uh, um, as a way of justifying uh, certain developments. I mean, yes, uh, you're quite right, Juan, that you know I have been leading a most incredibly unsustainable lifestyle, no question about it. But that doesn't uh, diminish the logic of the situation 
that we're confronting. You can, you can ridicule my lifestyle as a way of saying, you know, oh, I have no authority to speak in the way that I do. Fine. Right? Then well, don't listen. Don't listen. Just, don't listen. Don't listen. Just don't listen. Mm -hmm. But there are just incontrovertible facts that are not mine. <coughs> uh, the problem is that suburbia is a dinosaur that has turned the development of settlement uh, uh, or settlement development into the wrong direction. Now, if you don't recognize that, fine. You know, go ahead, lead your lifestyle. Your accusation of authoritarianism, I think is ridiculous. I'm just pointing out the, the, the arguments that some people are have accumulated over decades. And uh, I'm not imposing any solution. I'm just saying the logical consequence would be to do this and this and this. And it's not, I'm not, look, I'm, not, I'm neither Mao Zedong nor Adolf Hitler nor Joseph Stalin, and I'm not going to uh, stop uh, single family house development. You know, it's going to go ahead. So don't worry, just continue designing your luxury houses. That's fine with me. You know, that's uh, the lifestyle of many architects around the world. But it's just simply not sustainable. That's the fact. And you can, you can argue the way that you argue until the cows come home. And you can, you know, you can relativize. That's fine. It's not going to reduce the problem that we have in front of us. That's all. And I agree that there are definitely a lot of things that we should do better. I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with the, the reality of the problem. You are relativizing a lot of things and you are sort of playing, you know, I'm the good American, I'm a good citizen, and I, I, I'm the kind of anti-European, anti-European, uh, uh, you know, cultural importation guy. I mean, this is ridiculous. No, no, I it's don't, just I don't think I'm playing that role. I'm just yes, you are. different things listen, that you are pointing you can out. Listen, you can listen to your, your, your presentation in this recording. Okay. I mean, I don't know how I can be anti-European if I'm, I'm, I'm... You just I'm, said so. You just said, you know, the Europeans have, you know, produced all these problems. They've colonized the world, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, these imported models. I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't use the word colonize. I was referring particularly. You did use to the word colonize. I mean, I, you know, uh, listen but to the In any case, I was, I was referring more in particular to the, 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 the economic uh, uh, carbon footprint that the developed world has led. And this is right. putting the same standards in, in developing right. countries and trying to reach the same level. So we have used a lot of coal. And now we don't want anyone else to use it when we have been taking advantage of having that. So I'm, I'm, I'm referring to those kind of things. You know, of yeah. course, the colonial cessation is also an issue, no question about it. But it is, it is not the one I was thinking about when I was referring to No, the, the, the real problem, I mean, for example, the School of Architecture has a real problem. You know, we teach by models. We talk about Palladio. We talk about Le Corbusier. We talk about Mies. And we present all these single family houses, right? So that's one ideal. The impact that we have as architects on, you know, new settlement design on suburban sprawl is zero. But at the same time, we cultivate at the high end of, of our architectural culture, the ideal of designing freestanding single family houses. So, you know, square that. How do we deal with that? You know, if you, if you talk about, um, you know, that is a cultural difference. It is a cultural difference. Mm -hmm. And we are making that cultural difference as educators. So uh, as opposed to teaching, you know, uh, housing typology or multifunctional uh, residential and live work units, which nobody's doing, then, you know, uh, should we just go on and, and cultivate uh, next generations of uh, housing designs, you know, uh, single family house designs? Well, Fred, I'm the last, I'm the last person to have done a single family house in the studio because no one else was. I don't think there's a rash of single family house design going on at us. No, no, I'm not yeah, saying I, that. I don't so think I'm that's saying, I'm saying, I'm <laughs> saying <laughs> the history courses. Um, you know, well, yeah. I, I actually, I actually also don't think that that is necessarily. I, th I think that it's it's 
a bit more nuanced, I would say, than Wilfried, how you, you're sort of building up a, I think an enemy that doesn't really exist. Um, I would, I would say, I, I think there's, there's actually a lot of nuance there. And I, I would also say, you know, trying to sort of like between those like extreme positions, I, I think there is maybe, and again, I'm, I'm sort of like the moderate here and I'm going to get killed first, but, um, you know, I, I, I would say that there is to your point, Wilfried, I mean, I, I get the sort of argument, but I, I would say that you're coming back a lot to the dichotomy of like there's suburbia that's the enemy and then there is like density and and i think i don't know if juan was saying that i'm, I'm not i'm not entirely sure i think juan was, was making a point that i feel maybe was inherently as an argument also a bit more nuanced in that there are sort of like different models and you know i think um but, uh, Martin, I, I, I get the fact that there are different models. Austin has a density of 300 or 400 people per, uh, per uh, square kilometer. Berlin has a density of 4,000, <laughs> you know, uh, that much more. The problem is, um, and it's not, it's, I mean, it's ridiculous to talk about Hong Kong, right? And, and to talk about 100 story uh, apartment units, I'm not advocating Hong Kong, I'm not advocating 100 stories high rises, right? It's, it's simply ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, you can always go into, off into extremes. But I'm, all I'm saying is, we do not have enough time to play around and to relativize the situation. We have to take some really serious decisions. And I think it's great if your house harvests energy, Juan, Mm -hmm. making an important contribution, every house should do that. What I'm saying is single family houses can make a contribution to a sustainable lifestyle if they become more productive. But at this rate, to continue sprawl and to neglect uh, the productive capacity of the single family house would be to say, you know, just let's continue this lifestyle. And I, it's, it's just not a solution. Well, going back to Martin's comment, I, I, I mean, you, you, you may know, but I, I've been advocating for integrating the compact city into Austin for a long time, both through my writing, my work, and, and what I'm seeing of the need here is not about sometimes this dichotomy that, that Martin was mentioning. I think it's more about doing better what we know that we traditionally have been doing that could be improved and incorporate new models. What I think is unrealistic is to think that we're going to replace the model. I think we need to tweak the model and incorporate new models. That's to me the, the strategic that acknowledges all the problems that you're saying, which I completely agree with you in the sense that it's a reality. And we're seeing, like Jake said, improvements, improvements that are significant, like for saying we're not gonna produce more cars that are, you know, combusting engine in, in a few years. You know, there are very significant improvements in how the industry is changing, how things are changing. No one probably will imagine that electric cars were going to be so common even five years ago. You know, so there are realities that are changing quickly. And I think that we need to have a multiple approach that takes care of a lot of issues at the same time. So I'm not disagreeing with the essence of the problem that you're saying. I'm not advocating for maintaining the status quo per se, just because it's culturally significant. I'm just as interested in finding solutions as you are. I'm just saying that there's more nuance to how we can address that based on cultural difference and traditions in different places than, you know, needs, need to be taken into consideration. That's, that's all I'm saying. I'm not disagreeing with the problem. I'm just saying that the solution needs to be very nuanced. So I, I would, can I, um, interrupt. I, there, there's a conversation going on, like maybe as a last sort of a thread here um, in, in the chat that I find interesting. And, and that, that has to do, you know, it started with Alan's thought experiment. Um, um, th so um, if the premise of not single family housing was rolled into the incentives of the Biden administration's Build Back Better agenda, what would be required in legislation and follow-up policy. And so I, I think there, there's a conversation that has sort of like emerged from that in parallel a bit about the role of government and, and the role of sort of like public funding, I guess, for, for some of the um, 
housing and and therefore i think the, the relationship between um well infrastructure which is a big sort of topic right now of public funding um and and housing as relating to that or or for that matter not relating to that i i think that's a conversation that i find super interesting because it it has the potential to in some ways fundamentally shift how we look at housing if, if we sort of like if, if there is a sort of like this this component of infrastructure is it part of infrastructure is it not part of infrastructure um and to what extent is that a state or federal um mandate to fund that i i think you know that that's a conversation i find intriguing so um but I mean, just to come back to Jake's original point uh, to um, reform zoning. If we were to say, you know, if we look at different cities across the world, and one of the most successful models uh, being you know, the, the, the dense European model, where you've got so-called apartment buildings that actually contain different kinds of things. They contain retail, they contain offices, they contain residence in one building. That means you have a functional mix. That means that there's a potential that you could live close to where you work, as opposed to having to travel from one functional zone to another, right? If, if you were to say, you know, we have to reform zoning in, in, in terms of FAR and in terms of functional mixes and social mixes, and we have to require developers of uh, buildings, any buildings, to contain a mix of functions and a mix of housing, as they are doing in New York City and Amsterdam and elsewhere. That is the direction in which policy changes will be able to frame uh, this, the city of the future. You know, 15-minute uh, walking city is, is one of the models. Uh, so the, the issue is the complexity that everybody understands uh, uh, the um, development to be about needs to be understood by architects and by politicians and architects need to do their bit in terms of um, understanding what has gone wrong in the past and proposing solutions that of course are based on policy changes but ultimately have a design at the end you know, that provides a vision. So we have, to do, uh, we have to do our homework and we have to then mediate it, communicate it to the politicians so that they can use that in their public uh, statements about where uh, settlement design could move. I'll make one last remark, picking up on that thread that uh, Martin brought up, and you know, by way of Alan, um, and then then I got to go because I got to get some lunch or I'm going to kill over. But um, yeah, I, I don't think there is any way to, to fight for ending any more single-family construction. I, just, I don't see how that could happen in this country. But I do think we could fight for and make a really good case. We shouldn't be expanding freeways. We should never again, we have all the roads that we need in the United States. So I, I, and if we did that, if we succeeded in that, then that would have the effect of doing a lot of the things that we're, that we're all you know, wanting in our different ways to happen. So I think you know, I, th this idea that Alan brought up of infrastructure is something to focus on, I think is a very good way to think about it. Arguably, you would have to fund less road infrastructure if you funded better housing or, or better potential for developments that that are so it's not not just housing. I, I think it, and maybe the, the the mistake here is to think of a category of housing as just a sort of separate category because it it in some ways precludes um, that amount of sustainability that comes from live live work for example typologies like that or or even the integration of, of retail to the extent that that's possible i think you know i think that model i mean in my opinion that that model and wilfred you mentioned that that in berlin the apartment building for example or paris or wherever you take apartment buildings in paris they had like workshops in in the back and you know there was the industrial pre-industrial early industrial production going on in the same city fabric and i 
I think that is something to be looked at. But in, in my opinion, it depended of density, right? Like, I mean, I think you need a certain density to sustain that. In my opinion, that's the biggest critique that I would have of development, such as our own Austin Miller development, whether I like new urbanist architecture or not is secondary. But what I think is objectively something I would critique is, is the fact that there is a kind of like big supermarket that has a parking lot in front of it. And, and that essentially is it's, it's kind of zoned like a traditional suburb. And, and so I think that that's to me is another interesting point um, that that brings a certain sustainability for lack of a better word that comes through um, a sort of like a mixed fabric at, at any at any well not at any density but at a range of densities independent from whether we build apartment blocks or something a little less. All right. I think everybody's ready for some lunch, probably. Um, so thank you so much for staying like almost half an hour longer, everyone. Um, I think it's a, again, it's, it's a super interesting conversation that I would hope that we continue um, in one or, or the other format in the future, because I, th I think it's extremely um, pertinent and we're sort of like at the, at the heart of it right here. Thank 